We are in our third week of looking at uh, living life on mission as everyday missionaries. And last week we looked at kind of some, some of the fundamentals uh, of how to become better at being an everyday missionary, including the foundational idea of the gospel being the building block on which we must stand, the building block on which our faith is based, but also the building block from which we, we leap forth from as we go forth, loving, serving, investing, and inviting our neighbors. And, and part of that idea is that everyday missionaries can't just simply sit around reflecting, you know, it, it's great. The Bible is awesome. I love the Bible. I went to seminary, folks. I spent four years, about 80 hours a week, and I'm not kidding about the 80 hours a week, learning about the Bible. I love the Bible. I love to sit and read the Bible. I love to sit and read books about the Bible. I like to watch videos about books about the Bible. I mean, I, I, I'm a, like a nerd on this stuff, right? And I'm okay with that. You can call me a Bible nerd. I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that. I take no offense. But there comes a time where we have to get our nose from out of the book and get our noses into the world and go and love and serve and do the things that we're told about in here. We have to go and practically apply them and, and live them out with an urgency, loving others, living out our faith in real life. And that is what we've been talking about for the last couple of weeks. And we'll talk about it for probably one more or two more weeks. And I'll probably always talk about it in some way, shape, or form, but, but that's what we're going through. It, it's not enough just to have those biblical foundations, though we have to have them, but we have to take them and live them in our lives. It's called being missional. If you're looking for a single term, it's about, it's about being missional. Missionaries are somewhere else. Missional is here, okay? And people who live on mission are, are always moving towards other people. And we see this example modeled very clearly in the life of Jesus. And we see this in the model of Jesus as well as Paul on top of it. Um, they didn't wait for the world to come to them, right? If you study the way in which Paul and Jesus engaged people, they didn't wait for people, right? When Jesus was walking down a street, you buddy, up in the tree, right? He didn't, he didn't wait for that guy to create a conversation. Jesus reached out to him. Paul, very much in the same way, reached out to people. When, when you look at their ministry, they moved towards the other person. They sought them out. They didn't just sit there with a book in their hands, hoping somebody would come interrupt their day. No, they were active in it. A great example of this comes from the story, as I said, in Mark 5. Mark 5, 1 through 20. I'll read it to you because it's a pretty lengthy passage. This is one of the more interesting stories, in my opinion, in the Bible. I've always been fascinated by this story. Uh, Mark 5, 1 through 20 says this. Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the region of Gerenesis. As soon as he got out of the boat, that would be Jesus, as soon as he got out of the boat, a man with an unclean spirit came out of the tombs and met him. See, he lived in the tombs. And no one in this region had been able to restrain him anymore, not even with chains, the Bible says, because he had, he had been bound often with, with shackles and with chains, but he, would, he was so strong that he would break these shackles and chains. He would snap them, Scripture says, and smash the shackles. No one, you see, was strong enough to subdue him. And always, it says night and day, he was crying out among the tombs and in the mountains and he was picking up stones and he was cutting himself. You can see this, this is a scary looking dude. He's breaking stuff. He's cutting himself with stones. And, and when he saw Jesus from a distance, he starts in a dead run. He's running for Jesus. I can only imagine what the disciples are thinking. This giant muscle bound, bloody, just bear of a man running at Jesus, right? And he runs at Jesus and it says, he ran and he knelt down before him. And then it says, and he cried out in a loud voice, What do you have to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you before God, don't torment me. For he had told him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. Jesus says, What is your name? The man and the evil spirit within him said, My name is Legion, he answered. Because we are many, and he kept begging Jesus not to send them out of the region. 
This is where the story gets interesting, in my opinion. It says, Now there was a, a herd of pigs that were there feeding on the hillside, and the demon begged him, Send us into the pigs so that we may enter them. And so Jesus gave them permission. And the unclean spirits came out, and they entered the pigs, and a herd of about 2,000 pigs rushed down the steep bank into the sea, and then they, there they drowned. And the men who tended them ran off and reported it into the town and into the countryside, and the people went to see what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus... And they saw the man who had been demon-possessed by the legion sitting there. He was dressed. He was in his right mind. And it says, they were afraid. The eyewitnesses described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told them about the pigs. Then they began to beg him, Jesus, to leave their region. Now, as he was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed, he he keeps begging Jesus, right? But now for something different. He says, Jesus, take me with you. I want to be with you. Don't, Don't leave me here. But Jesus says, no, I won't let you do that. Instead, you're going to stay here, and what you're going to do is you're going to go back to your own people, and you're going to go and report to them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So then, this man went and began to proclaim in Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And it says in Scripture, all were amazed. Right? What an amazing story. That's the Word of God. You see, Jesus intentionally went out to this man, this man who was an outcast from his society, an outcast from his community. Jesus goes directly to him a man that everybody was afraid of, a man that nobody would have anything to do with. Jesus goes directly to this man. And he has compassion on this man. This man's society had written off. And ultimately, because of Jesus' love and compassion, it transforms his life. See, when we live our lives on mission... It requires us to be willing to follow Jesus' example and sometimes go to the other side. Go to the people who are far from God. Go to those we're most unlikely to want to go to, right? But they're often the ones who need it the most. Those are the people you find Jesus hanging out with, don't you? Jesus didn't hang out at the temple with all the people who thought they were close to God. Who were Jesus' friends? What did the Pharisees accuse him of? That Jesus? He hangs out with those hookers, drunks, tax collectors, right? That's who Jesus hangs out with. The loose women, the wild men. That's who Jesus hung out with. That's who Jesus chose to seek out, to engage and interact with. Now, did Jesus only interact with them? No. He had his band of merry followers, right? He had 12 very faithful men with him. He certainly was part of the temple and went to the temple when he needed to go to the temple, worshipped and praised as was appropriate. But he was continually looking for opportunities to step into the lives of those who were far from God. The people who need our help aren't just going to show up at our doorsteps. Even though God has planted us here and placed us here, the people who most need to hear the good news of the gospel are often not the ones who are going to come begging us to hear about it. So, We as Christ followers, if we're already on that team, we have to identify where those people are and start moving towards them. We have to invest in the lives of others and intentionally join God with where he is already at work in the world. And then within that, we have to invite people into a a discipleship, disciple-making relationship, and then actively work to equip them, developing them as believers. See, it's, it's not enough for us just to, you know, give them the flu shot and inoculate them with the gospel and then leave them alone. That's not how it's supposed to work. 
We have to keep investing and keep helping grow and keep sharing and keep loving even after they get that first dose. We're in it for the long haul. We have to work and choose to equip in the process of disciple making, helping people who are far from God come to know Jesus, then helping them as they come to know Jesus to grow in Jesus. That's what, as spiritually mature believers, we have been put here for, to raise up the next generation. And so the first step in this process, of course, is we have to get to know our neighbors, right? If we're honest, by nature, each and every one of us is a little self-absorbed, right? Some of us more than others. I readily will admit that I'm probably pretty self-absorbed, and I know I used to be really self-absorbed, right? I mean, I remember my, my pre-Christian state the only thing I cared about was me, making me happy and making me feel good. And if you couldn't make me happy or make me feel good, well, you weren't that important to me. Rude, but that's the way I lived. And even as converted Christians, we still carry some of that in with us, don't we? We're all still a little bit self-focused. Now, some of us more than others, of course. But it's easy to be inward focused. It's easy to think only about ourselves. How, how will this affect me? How will this impact me? What will they think of me if I tell them about Jesus? I invite them to church. I invite them to Bible study. I love them, I serve them, and I invest them. What are they going to think about me? Right? And sometimes we look at people and we think, well, what am I going to get out of this? Right? You ever had relationships like that? Where you're only in that relationship because you might get something out of that relationship? Right? Uh, Again, this is being a little self focused, a little self centered, a little self absorbed. What's in it for me? You ever have that attitude, or am I the only one? Right? And if we approach the gospel with that attitude, we're going nowhere. The gospel will die with us. The church will die in a generation or two because we're unwilling to step out of our comfort zone. We're, we're unwilling to take the extra steps. We're unwilling, as Scripture teaches us, to put the other before ourselves. Time and time again in Scripture, we are, we are called to, we are, we are demanded of to go, to go and love and serve and make disciples of all nations. Right? Loving them, serving them, praying for them, inviting them, investing in them, all these things that we keep talking about. But think for a moment. What if, right? One of my rules when I used to be, when I used to oversee youth groups, kids love what if games, right? Kids, kids will ask you what if questions forever. So I'm hesitant sometimes to use a what if question. But what if we were really serious about this as a church? What if we really did start inviting our friends, our families, our neighbors? What if we started serving them? What if we started loving them, started investing in them? What if? I know I want my friends to know Jesus. I know I want your friends to know Jesus. We all want our kids to know Jesus, our grandkids, Would my neighbor be a better neighbor if they knew Jesus? Probably. If my neighbors are watching this, I'm not talking about a specific one. But what if we were really serious about this? What sort of difference would it make in our world? 
What's in it for me? Well, Scripture tells us what's in it for you. Heartache, pain, suffering, trials, right? It's not going to be easy. There's going to be resistance. When you begin to tell people about Jesus, it sometimes gets a little rough. Because there are things that work in this world that don't want that to occur. There are people and there are powers fighting against you loving, serving, investing, and inviting others. But it is worth it. I mentioned this last week. I don't think there are any stakes higher than that which the church has. What is at stake in a church is eternity. Everything else is temporary. What we're talking about is forever. So what if we got really serious about doing this? Each and every one of us. I think God could change the world through us. I believe it's possible. I believe in each and every one of us is the opportunity and potential to transform eternities. What if? Everyday missionaries need to understand that we have to continually be assessing and identifying the people around us that God has placed into our lives who need to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. And once we identify them, Again, we have to take that next step. It's not enough just to say, okay, you have cancer. Okay, if the doctor walks into your room, after doing an examination, says, Bill, sorry to tell you, you got cancer. Walks out of the room. You're like, uh, uh, aren't we going to do something about this? Right? What's the plan? It's not enough just to identify the problem. We've got to do something about the problem, right? And one of the things that we have to do first is we have to identify what kind of cancer do we have because the treatment's going to be a little bit different. In the same way with people who are far from God, how are we going to approach them? Some people need a very direct approach. You need to get in their face and say, you need Jesus, quit screwing around and come back. Most people that doesn't work with so well though, right? Most people, we're going to have to invest in a relationship. Most people, we're going to have to put some time in. Most people, we're going to have to develop a little relational credibility before they are willing to listen to us. Everybody's a little weirded out when your first approach to them is, let me tell you about Jesus. Even as a pastor, when somebody comes up to me and says, hey, let me tell you about Jesus. I'm like, whoa, 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 hold on a second, buddy. I don't even know you yet. Right? But when we begin to love, when we begin to serve, when we invest, when we then look at their lives and we see what they need and how we can serve them best, that creates opportunities to share the gospel. This is a process called relational evangelism. And it is a slow and laborious process. But it's a very effective process. My suspicion is if I said, how many of you are naturally gifted evangelists? Not many of you would put your hands up, right? A couple of you in this room probably are. And in fact, I bet you more than a couple are. Some of you don't know your evangelists would be my guess. But most people don't think of themselves as evangelists. I don't think of myself as an evangelist. But can I be friends with people? Yeah. Can I share life with people who share common interests with me? Yeah. Can I serve my neighbor? Can I love my neighbor? Can I, can I help the teacher at the school? Can I, can I go and help the neighbor lady? Can I go and serve this person? Yeah. I can do that. And then can I choose to do it again and again and again? Yeah. 
And as I do that, God begins to open up cracks and and windows and doors for me to step into it with the light and love of Jesus Christ. So learning about that person, understanding the cultural context in which we're ministering to them, finding a common ground with them is key to us reaching the world around us. And that brings us to our key passage for the day. It brings us to 1 Corinthians 9.22, a passage you're probably very familiar with. This is the Apostle Paul. And he's reminding the church at Corinth about how he goes about doing what he does. And Paul says this to the church at Corinth. He says, To the weak I became weak, in order that I might win the weak. Paul says, I have become all things to all people, so that I may, by every possible means, save some. Now, the scripture doesn't mean that the Apostle Paul became like a, a cultural chameleon and kind of just blended in with his surroundings. But what it does mean is he found a way to meet the people where they were, to communicate the gospel to them, the central truths of the love of Jesus. He found a way to communicate to that in a way that met the need of the person he was speaking to. So as you are working through this. I continue to pray for your one person. I've got all of their names on my desk. And as you continue to work through reaching out to at least one person, begin to think about how can I really, really connect to this person? What do I need to do? How can I love them? How can I serve them? Or where can I invite them How can I invest in them that it will open up a door for me to share God's love? As you do that, they will see God's love through you. And as you do this, not only am I in prayer for you, but you should be in prayer for the person you want to reach. It all begins with prayer. As I said, There's a lot at work against this. Always start with prayer. The next step in a process of our living an intentional life, or the next step in the process of our, is our living an intentional life. I messed that up twice. We have to live an intentional life. Let's say it that way. See, this doesn't happen by accident, folks, right? Once you've identified the person, once you've been praying for that person, once you've figured out how I think it is that I can reach that person, you've got to be intentional about it then, right? It's not going to happen unless you plan for it. If your plan is, I hope I bump into that person today, that's not a plan. If your plan is, well, maybe I'll be lucky and they'll be at Paul Beck's when I go to get a, a, you know, some milk. That's not a plan. A plan is, I'm going to go over to their house and bring them some fresh baked cookies. Well, that's a plan. Right? A plan is, I'm going to call them on the phone. A plan is, I'm going to write a letter encouraging them, thanking them. Loving them. A plan takes action. Paul made this part of the process very clear when he wrote to the church at Thessalonica. 1 Thessalonians 2.8 says this. Paul writes, We cared so much for you that we were pleased to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives because you had become dear to us. Yeah, we got to declare the gospel but we also have to invest our lives. And investing is an intentional thing. How many of you saved for retirement without intentionally saving for retirement? Well, Social Security, right? They kind of yank some money out of your pocket. But if you wanted to save, no, you had to go and open an account with a broker or an investment firm or at least tell your boss you wanted it on the 401k or, or something. It took some intentionality. And in the same way, we have to be intentional about investing our lives, our time, our resources, our gifts into others. 
The gospel tells us that Jesus sacrificed everything for us, not only modeling sacrifice for us through his death, but also through his life. Over and over again throughout the Gospels, Jesus constantly and continually, intentionally pours his life into the people who are closest to him. He sacrificially served all with whom his life intersected. Being on mission isn't simply about going to a specific place, but it's about being intentional about getting there. Investment is always intentional. See, God's already on mission. God's already at work. And God wants you to join with him. That's one of the amazing things that continually blows my mind, that we as Christians get to live life on the front lines of spiritual transformation, of life transformation, if we will choose to. But we have to choose to. See, God wants to use you. God wants to use us. He wants to use us to reach out to the people around us. Living intentionally starts right now, where you already are. It's not about moving to another location or finding new people. It's about a way of life. It's about looking for everyday opportunities with intentionality. And as we do that, God can use us to do amazing things far greater than we ever could imagine. You might not see it on a day-to-day basis. See, it would be great. I, I wish as a pastor I could tell you, every day, man, I get to come to work. And every day, there's a new soul won every day in my office. Because that would really help me get up the next morning, right? Because then I'd know, okay, I've got to get into the office because that next soul is going to be waiting there for me. It doesn't work like that, though, folks. We've got to keep our hands to the plow. Keep on moving, keep on working, keep on busting sod, keep on going. Keep on planting. And as we do that, the fruit that comes will come from God. And the fruit that can grow will far surpass anything I could ever grow on my own. This is what the Great Commission is all about, right? As Christians, we hear sermons all throughout our lives about this great commission. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Fundamentally, that is who we are to be, though. When Jesus was leaving the world, the last things he wanted to tell us, tell his people, tell his followers, these are the important things. Love and go, right? Right? Love and go. That's what I want you to do. Love and go. What if we did that? One of the dangers for us as Christians is never taking that next step. I've seen this happen. This happens in churches throughout the world. Never taking that next step. So for some of us, the next step is getting there intentionally, going and loving and serving. For others of us, maybe we're already doing that. And that brings another step. And that other step is, at some point, you have to try to seal the deal, right? At some point, you actually have to make an invitation to the person. Whether it's an invitation to come to church or an invitation to have them invite Jesus into their lives, at some point in time, you got to close the deal. You really do. And this is where I find a lot of people begin to get weak kneed. Right? Where we get those butterflies in our bellies. I got bigger butterflies than some of you. Our knees get a little weak. Because that's where the rubber meets the road, actually when we actually have to invite somebody. Inviting them to church, inviting them to Bible study, inviting them to youth group, inviting them into your home where you could just have a meal with them and love them. Or maybe even inviting them to know Jesus as their Savior. At some point in time, folks, we do have to seal the deal. Remember my car salesman example? 
kind of like that. If you walked around the car lot all day with some strange guy and he never tried to sell you a car and then you walked into the, the dealer's office trying to find an employee so they could sell you the car that you found on the lot and you see the guy's picture on the wall of salesman of the year, you think that's a little bit weird. Why didn't he try to sell me a car? Eventually, we got to get to the point. Sell him the car. Make the invite. Luke 19.10 says this. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. That's why Jesus came. And if Jesus came to seek and save the lost, we need to be about that. We need to be ready when God provides those opportunities to seal the deal. Now, while we get a little afraid of this, and this makes us a little bit nervous, I want to remind you of a few things as I wrap up. You're not alone in any of this. We're all in this together. We're here to cheer for you. We're here to support you. We're here to love you. If you'd like to know more about any of these steps, if you have somebody in mind very particularly, like somebody you're trying to reach and you just don't know how, reach out to another church member. Reach out to me. Ask for some ideas. Ask for some suggestions. How, How would you deal with this situation? How would you deal with this person? How would you reach into this life Share with me your wisdom. Because we're in this together. We don't have to walk this road alone. Also, as I said before, I'm praying for you. And we should all be praying for one another. Praying that God would open opportunities for us to love and serve, invest and invite in the people in whose lives God has planted us in. And then through that, the results will be to God's glory. That is what it is for us to live life on mission. You see, since the very beginning of Christianity, Christianity has been about multiplication. Since its very inception. And I believe we have tremendous multiplication potential here today. What if, what if we live this way? How will our lives, our community, our church, our world, and our eternity be different? The stakes are high. Let us live life's on mission that we might make much of God And someday, when we see Jesus in heaven, each and every one of us will hear those beautiful words, well done, good and faithful servant. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.